Hello class and uh, welcome to lecture number three, Framing Your Argument. Um, I wanted to start off by saying I apologize that this is running late. Um, I got bogged down in other things. I will not make a habit of this and if you have trouble viewing this by the deadline on Canvas, don't worry. Um, just let me know through email if this is conflicting with your other scheduled events. And, We'll talk about this. So anyways, framing your argument. This is an important uh, lecture for understanding what kind of argument your pitch really is. And we're going to get into it a lot as we go through this. Um, what you should have read for this, and if you haven't yet, you might want to stop this lecture and go to it, is a reading handout from Everything's an Argument number seven called Evalu Evaluations or Evaluative Arguments. Um, it's on Canvas under readings in the files. So please check that out. Um, we're going to be using a lot of that to talk about this today. Um, so what is an evaluative argument? And the, as, as the reading says, and you guys are well aware of, evaluative arguments are things that we do all the time. Um, you know, just this morning when I was getting ready to step out the door, I took a look in the mirror to make sure that, you know, I didn't look like a slob. That's an evaluative argument. I mean, it's not. I'm not trying to convince anybody else. It's not rhetoric because I'm not working with an audience, but it's something that I'm considering. And when I'm, I guess I am working with an audience because I'm considering it in terms of myself. But if I'm having a conversation with a friend about why we uh, we shouldn't watch this football game but watch this football game, or why um, this I want to listen to this song on the radio and or on Spotify and not this song then that's an evaluative argument. You're trying to show why something is more important or why something is more valuable, um, not in terms of money, but in terms of other types of value. And so that that's basically what we're talking about. Or to give you a more formal definition, <clears throat> what is an evaluative argument? An argument used to determine the value of an idea, item, action against an agreed upon standard. So basically, if you're talking about why you want to watch, let's say, well, NFL kickoff is this weekend. If you, let's say you want to watch um, the Colts game and not the Bengals game, okay? Why? You might say, well, it's a more competitive game, okay? If that's your agreed upon standard, competition, the value of the competition, then you can make that argument that this game is more competitive, so we should watch it. It's a better game, in other words. Um, if I'm talking about a movie, and I'm talking about a comedy specifically, so within that genre of comedy, if I want to talk to my friends about which movie we should watch, I might say that the agreed upon standard is how the movie, how the comedy, how much it makes me laugh. Okay? So if that's the standard, then a lot of romantic comedies are not going to fit that bill. Even though they're some of them are great movies, they're not going to make you laugh out loud. So that standard of comedy, agreed upon standard, as far as how much it makes you laugh, or uh, laugh out loud in other words, would probably fa favor slapstick stuff like Monty Python um, over more cerebral comedies, things that make you think, and maybe you don't laugh out loud, but you enjoy it. Um, so that's basically what we're talking about is to determine the value of an idea or the supremacy, how much, if it's better or worse, um, to determine if it's worth money or whether it's important to think about in terms of our project and your pitch. Um, to determine the value of an idea based upon an agreed upon standard. And we'll talk about this throughout the course of this lecture, but this agreed upon standard can be enforced by the rhetor. So you can determine what the standard is, but you need to make sure that they know. All right. So evaluative arguments are based upon an ancient Greek um, genre of speech called an epideatic speech. And I probably mispronounced that, and I apologize if you actually know Greek. Um, but these were speeches of blame or praise. Uh, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, this is Socrates, Aristotle, and Plato, they had um, very specific senses of what constituted art, and this type of speech was something that was an art form. Um, and so there was a very specific way to go about it. Now today, and back then too, there were evaluative arguments 
that were, um, you know, just comparisons. You know, I want this wine, not that wine, or whatever it was back in ancient Greece. But um, they also had these um, epideatic speeches. So the, these speeches of praise and of blame. And the way you praise is against a standard. Okay, this guy is greater than the, the average human. Okay, this king or whatever. Or this criminal is the lowest of the low, and so I'm going to write a speech about him because he doesn't deserve to be called a human. That is a speech of definition, but if I talk about how he is worse than everybody else in the society, then that's a question of and an argument for comparison or evaluation. Okay, If you want to think about it in terms of the stasis heuristics from the first chapter on rhetoric, then you might turn to this idea of questions of quality. Okay, that's where this comes from. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it important? Is it trivial? This is very important for our um, for our pitch project, okay, for making your pitch. Is it influential or derivative, meaning does it come from other things, all right? Now, one common thing that I think about all the time is um, the value of um, socially derived fee, uh criticism or, or feedback on movies and music and that sort of stuff. By socially derived, I mean just people on the internet voting on it. Okay, so Rotten Tomatoes is a good example. And if you look at a movie like the new Ghostbusters, and I don't know if you've seen it, but um, it can be, it, I enjoyed it. I thought it was a funny movie when I saw it. But the um, people at Rotten Tomatoes gave it a 73%, which is a little bit higher than you might guess. Because before the movie came out, they were talking, there was all sorts of talk on the internet about how horrible it was. Why? Because they were making evaluative arguments about how a movie with an all-woman cast could not match up to the original. Okay? So in terms of influential and derivative, the new Ghostbusters is derivative. It comes, it's not the same movie as the original Ghostbusters from the 1980s, but it comes from that idea. And it's not influential like the original Ghostbusters was. So if you're making an argument on an agreed upon standard of some, whether something is influential, this falls short. Okay, so this evaluative argument would make sure that the new Ghostbusters is not looked favorably upon. But if you were to talk about good or bad in terms of comedic value, you could come across it in different ways. So like critics gave it a pretty uh, average, but good score. Viewers hated it. If you look down here, if you can't see it on your screen, then um, maybe check out the PowerPoint slide. 73% of Rotten Tomatoes gave it this, but 57% of viewers liked it. Well, you know, there's a lot of this sort of influential and derivative thing, because there are some diehard people that love the original Ghostbusters. Okay? So anyways, that sort of conversation, that's an evaluative judgment and it's an evaluative argument if you try to convince someone else about whether or not it is important. Okay, so remember we talked about this uh, in a previous lecture, rhetorical, the rhetorical situation or a way to understand whether something is or where the rhetoric comes from. So rhetoric is this interaction between the rhetor or the author or speaker, the subject and the audience. You need all three of those in order for it to be um, a rhetorical situation. So what you're looking at with, if we keep going with this Ghostbusters thing, what we're looking at is someone making the argument to people paying attention on the internet that Go Ghostbusters 2016 is a derivative movie and not worthwhile. Okay. If I'm making that case, then the exigence is the what uh, is the movie, the movie coming out. Okay, so I want to evaluate that movie. So I'm going to make this claim in my blog post or whatever. Okay, the context is within the movie history of comedies of Ghostbusters. I might also include in that context the current moment and the uh, type of movies put together by Paul Feig, who directed this 2016 Ghostbusters. Okay, Constraints, those are genre constraints and that sort of thing. But the evaluative situation here, okay, the rhetorical situation of this evaluation, all of that, this stuff still comes into play. This is just one type of rhetorical situation where I'm trying to, and this is where 
my re retor, the subject retor idea, or what you might call the thesis statement, this is centered on an evaluation of the exigence of the problem or of the item, action, whatever it is. Okay. As usual, I just want to mention this now. If you have questions, please email me. Okay. I'm happy to answer them. So one thing that we want to talk about when we talk about evaluations is this idea of criteria. Um, when we say that you have to evaluate against a standard, what we mean is these criteria or what makes something valuable. What makes it good, what makes it bad, what makes it influential, what makes it trivial. Okay. Uh, so what we're talking about when we talk about criteria, criteria is this thing of against which we're ju ju ah, judging. And I'm sorry that this cut off. I didn't realize that this would show up like this um, on your slides. Let me switch this real quick. There we go. Um, so consider so against an evaluation has no merit without this judge, this standard against which to judge. Because in, if not, it just becomes my opinion versus your opinion. And rhetoric is not about everybody saying what their opinion is. It's about trying to convince your audience about what is worthwhile or about your topic. Okay, so if it's just everybody's opinion, I think this is the best, I think this is the best, or I think this movie is great, I think this movie sucks, then you're not really engaging in the rhetorical situation. You're just all talking about your own opinion. Where rhetoric comes in is trying to prove to someone that your opinion is correct. And that's where you need this standard of against which to judge it. So if I say it's horrible because I hate the music in a movie, well, that doesn't make much sense. You know, That's not what the force of the movie is. Unless I'm talking about Fantasia or a movie like that where music is so important, uh, a musical or something like that. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So when you're thinking about the criteria involved in an evaluative argument as it is or an evaluative argument that you're going to make, you want to consider what determines value. Okay, What gives this value? Uh, however you want to define that. So here, if we look at Kentucky basketball, and I know not everybody is a huge fan of Kentucky basketball, but it came to UK, so I'm going to talk about it a little bit. Um, Kentucky basketball, this is an article from Sports Nation about who the best basketball players in from Kentucky have ever been, the professional basketball players. And as you can see, there are two guys from the near, from recent past. In fact, both of these guys are John Calipari's recruits, uh, Davis and Wall, okay? They are considered among the best pro professional basketball players to come out of UK in the long history of UK. But what determines value here? Are we talking the money that they make? Because yeah, they do. If you compare them to a guy like Dan Issel from the six or from the seventies, then yeah, they make tons of money, and Issel didn't because of inflation. Okay, but if we're talking about value added to a team then we might want to talk about Jamal Mashburn from the 90s instead of one of these guys as one of the best to be. Or if we're talking about longevity, we might talk about Tony Delk or Nazi Muhammad. These are all UK players that are in the NBA or have been in the NBA. But when we talk about the greatest, what are we using? Are we talking points scored in the, prof in the press, uh, at the professional basketball level? Are we talking about um, central importance to the team? Okay. These are all questions, but we need to figure out what that criteria is. And there could be multiple criteria. I mean, if you remember from your SAT word prep, criteria is plural. All right, so one criterion might be playing time. One criterion might be um, points scored, OK? And so what are those things that will help us determine the value of the greatest UK player, OK? Um, it should be rooted in the context of the rhetorical situation, okay? So we're talking about the greatest player in basketball history. So this is a context. We might be specifically talking about Kentucky basketball, but we want to think in terms of basketball as a whole, in terms of that field, okay? What else could this be compared to? So how would we compare the greatest Kentucky basketball player against the greatest North Carolina basketball player or the greatest Kansas basketball player, all right? And it should also allow for differentiation and distinction. So 
you know, if everybody's doing it, if everybody, if it matches everybody, then that doesn't help you at all as a criteria. So for instance, if we're going to say the greatest, 10 greatest UK players ranked by Sporting News, and we say must be in the NBA for one year, well, that's not going to help us at all. That There are more than 10 players that have done that. Now, if I'm at a small school like Davidson, where Steph Curry come from, came from, then, yeah, that's a good cutoff because not many people from Davidson have made it to the NBA. So if I say the greatest basketball players to ever play at Davidson, then Steph Curry is going to be in there because he was in the NBA. But you want your criteria to be able to make a distinction, okay, to be able to, to rank these if you want to think about it that way or in order to separate th these um, the things being compared, evaluated into groups, okay? Um, that's uh, one thing to consider when we're talking about differentiation. It's a way to differentiate what you're evaluating. So if you're only evaluating one thing instead of making a rank, what you're evaluating against the rest of the world. So you're not making a rank, but you're trying to differentiate this, what you're evaluating, from other things, okay? These are the types of uh, criteria. There are a lot different types but these are big big uh, categories so you have comparative so what we've been talking about how do we compare these things off all right by comparative I just mean like one-on-one -on -one or one to, to a certain number how do we rank it okay that's one way to decide on the criteria uh, you can have categorical okay that's a yes no type thing does it do this does it not okay so in a little bit I'm going to talk about trigger warnings one thing that I might look at with trigger warnings is, does it impact teaching? That's a yes, no question. Now there's something I might do to, to add to that criteria, okay? But does it impact teaching to use trigger warnings? They, that's a yes. So how else can I do that? That's not a very good criteria because everything impacts teaching. So there's not a lot of differentiation, but that's a categorical thing. And not every categorical thing is denies differentiation. All right, and then you have value-based or ideological. And you want to be aware of this because this is where a lot of the assumptions come in, the unstated assumptions behind what you're looking at. Uh, these can be political, these can be cultural, these can be uh, whatever. Um, but you want to be aware of what criteria are value-based. So, you know, if I talk about what's the greatest country in, in the world and I say freedom, freedom to, freedom to speech, freedom of self-determination and all that stuff is the most important. That's an ideological thing. That's something that we think in America is super important. So that makes America look great. And um, so you want to be aware of that. But it doesn't mean that it's not going to be a worthwhile criteria. It's just something you want to pay attention to if it's an ideological cri uh, criteria or a value base. So I value bravery in my soldiers. So the most brave is going to or, so if a soldier is um, a significant actor in a, in a war, then I'm going to think about it in terms of bravery along with other things. Right? I hope this is making sense. So you have different type of evaluative arguments. You have quantitative evaluations right? and qualitative. So your quantitative evaluations are relatively black and white, relatively... Uh, clear, so you can make an absolute distinction if it's solely quali uh, quantitative. So this, of course, quantitative means countable, right? So it's a useful comparative criteria that relies on numbers in some way. You know, it doesn't have to be twelve shots versus whatever. It can be um, more abstract, but it's a it's a numbers game or something that's very easy to measure. Okay. Um, it is limited in its applicability. Okay, so for example, your book or the reading mentions um, SAT tests and IQ tests as a way to evaluate the intelligence of a student or of a class. Well, that's a qualitative or a quantitative evaluation. Is a student smart because they have a high IQ? But IQ has been talked about, and if you know any education majors or are an education major, then you are going to come across this as only one type of um, intelligence. Okay, so what else is there? Is there if someone's got a high IQ, they might have a low um, empathic intelligence or 
um, meaning the ability to empathize with people. So that's something to consider. It's, it's limited, if we think about it in IQ terms, to say that someone is smart because there's also, you know, uh, applicability versus, um, which is kind of what IQ tests, and uh, knowledge of facts, which is more, um, you know, memorization. And if you have a, if you have a photographic memory, then you might have great recall of facts, but an IQ test might be challenging for you because it has to do with the manipulation of things in a um, in an abstract way a lot of times. But some examples of qual of and uh, one more thing, I'm sorry, numbers can have a qualitative root if you're not paying attention. So, uh, for instance, just to go all the way back up. So if we look at this, this is a number and this is a number, but these numbers are, t are qualitative. All right, they're not quantitative because it's someone's opinion. They gave it a four out of five stars or whatever. Um, that has been turned into a number. That four out of five stars, though, is based completely on qualitative things, not on easily measured ideas. All right. So some examples of qualitative or quantitative analysis, sports analytics. Okay. If you think about the way baseball is studied, it's studied a lot in terms of batting average and that sort of thing. These are numbers. These are hard numbers. And there are different ways to get into that. And if you've seen the movie Moneyball, you'll know that. But um, sports analytics is very quantitative. And there's a big argument, or the big thing going on right now <coughs> in football and uh, basketball about whether or not analytics are useful. Okay, So the Houston Rockets are using a lot of sports analytics, but they're not doing so great. So is analytics useful on a team sport like basketball or on a more individual sport like baseball where they're a team of people working individually. You can think of this as micro polling for electoral politics it tends to be more quantitative. And then Billboard's top 100. If you don't know the ranking for Billboard, which is has a lot to do with who gets invited to the Grammys, is mainly based off of sales, album sales. But there are artists out there now that solely rely on music downloads instead of album sales, and then they tour to make their money. Chance the Rapper, for instance, <laughs> has yet to be nominated for a, a Grammy, even though he's considered one of the best musicians working today, and that's because he gives his music out for free. All right. Now, you might argue about whether or not that's smart, but um, to talk about billboards and the popularity of an artist in terms of qualitative or quantitative one thing to look at the popularity of a musician is to look at their billboard ranking for their latest album. Okay, well, Chance the Rapper's not going to be on there, so that might hurt this quantitative evaluation. Okay, qualitative. These are what you think about in terms of you know the best pizza place or uh, which classes to take that are most useful for you or whatever. Um, a lot of these have come down to qualitative evaluations. The problem with qualitative, quantitative is very easy to set a specific, but qualitative arguments, this side, there's more abstraction and more complexity. Okay, it's, It allows you to really delve into whether something's worthwhile or what value it has. But um, the, there's a lot of gray area, so it doesn't allow for an absolute conclusion. And this is where rhetoric comes in a lot. A lot of quantitative evaluations rely solely on this, Rhetoric doesn't need to come into a case. So if you say <laughs> the baseball player with the highest batting average is the best player in, in the league, then that's a, that's a black and white thing. It's obvious from the start. This, is, this guy is going to be, at the end of the season, is going to be the best player according to this ranking. But if we talk about other things like fielding and that sort of stuff and bring that in, then we're bringing in more qualitative stuff. And it allows for less absolute conclusion. So, for instance, and I'm sorry to keep this on sports, but um, I guess that's where my head's at. Um, Michael Jordan versus LeBron J James is a big debate that goes on right now about who's the best basketball player. Well, a lot of that has to do with this complexity, okay? Who has a killer instinct? Who uh, won more championships? That's a quantitative thing, right? Um, who's more valuable to their team? That's a huge qualitative thing. 
Okay, so you have Jordan, who was great in the clutch and all this when playing basketball, but um, LeBron James is higher on assist numbers if he's not as great of a shooter. So you have these value to the team arguments that have a lot more to do with qualitative decisions or qualitative evaluations. Because of the nature of it, cri the criterion must be more explicitly established and agreed upon, okay, in a qualitative evaluation. It must be stated. Here, it can be implied more. Here, you, you, you have to be more concrete about what you mean when you say something's the best. All right, so for instance, if I say that, you know, my wife makes the best pancakes, well, I have to be able to back that up. And I have to say, well, what do I mean by best, okay? Um, if it matters, you know, usually with stuff like that, you just let it go. Um, so some examples of qualitative evaluations are when a presidential debate finishes, they always have all the pundits get up there and say who won. That's qualitative because they're, a lot of the time they're spouting their different opinions, Trump versus Clinton. Okay. But, um, who, who wins is most of the time it's a qualitative evaluation based off of where you stand, what you value in terms of debate prep or debate performance, okay? The Oscars, Emmys, and Grammys are very evaluative. It's a lot of comparison between best, the Best Picture nominations, okay? So if we look at the Best Picture nominations, then it's hard to compare them on a, you know, quantitative basis unless you were just to give the Oscar to the highest, excuse me, highest grossing film, in which case I think last year it would have been Star Wars. Um, but uh, that's not what they do. What they do is they look at it and they see, okay, this is how well this actor performed versus this actor and this other movie. This is what the director did. This is what the producer did. And they try to compare all these different things in order to determine who's the best, best picture or uh, best TV show or best um, album. Okay, And all of these are qualitative rather than quantitative decisions. Okay. Now, um, if you got a chance to, and I know a lot of you didn't, you chose the other options, but one of the discussions I asked you to take a look at the trigger warning debate sparked by the University of Chicago at the beginning of the semester. They sent a letter out to all of their incoming freshmen saying that the University of Chicago does not believe in trigger warnings or safe spaces, which is a way to say that um, they are encouraging you to grapple with tough issues, okay? The idea of a trigger warning, if you don't, don't know, is um, the, is, let me see, is a trigger warning is when your professor lets you know before you encounter a text or before you start talking about an idea that it might be problematic, okay? So for instance, I taught a literature course last year and there was a, a novel that had a rape scene in it. I, I thought the novel was important that we should have read it, but I needed to let everybody know beforehand that there was a rape scene in case one of the students had a rough time, like a traumatic experience in the past, or in case you are just really impacted by that sort of scene. So, you know, that's what the idea of a trigger warning is for, is to kind of give this, this preface, all right? Um, there's a big debate going on about trigger warnings because a lot of people assume that that means that you are just babying the students, okay, and not giving them the right, the right in, um, challenges in terms of the content that they encounter or read, okay. But you do have the other side of it, which is more about don't you don't want to shock students; you want to you want to help them out, okay. So um, if I were to determine this criteria in my own evaluation of whether trigger warnings are useful, um, then I would think about it in three ways. How disruptive is it to the classroom community? Okay, So in terms of the group of students in that classroom and how they interact, will a trigger warning hurt this? Okay, Or will it help? Will it open up conversation or will it shut it down? So this is, uh, this is a criteria that's a qualitative criteria, and it's one that will, I, I would need to be more specific about why it's important in order to make my argument. That's where the making it, uh, establishing the criteria comes in. 
how does it impact learning? I could look at this quantitatively in terms of grade point average, or I could look at it in terms of dropout rates for students. I could look at it for different quantitative ways or at it qualitatively. And how innovative is this? Okay, so when I'm looking at this, as far as determining what criteria are important, I just want to think about for myself, if I think that something is useful in the classroom, what makes it useful? Okay. If it's useful, it's not disruptive. Okay. If it's useful, it's going to help the classroom community. It's not going to hurt the classroom community. If it's useful, it has a positive impact on learning. Okay. Or a neutral impact on learning, but then it's not really useful. Okay. And if it's innovative, why is that important? Well, that's just a way to ch to, to um, see, you know, if this is a problem or not. So this is more of less evaluative and more definitional. Is it a problem? Yes or no? All right. This is more evaluating how it impacts. Okay. But if I'm making a case about trigger warnings and why they are useful or not, then I'm going to want to figure out uh, how the criteria or how the trigger warnings match up against these questions. Okay. I hope that helps. If not, email me. So if I'm making this evaluation, okay, I thought I got rid of that. Um, sorry. If I'm making this evaluation, ignore this. If I'm making this evaluation, then I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to make this, this is my claim. Trigger warnings are necessary in the modern classroom. Because when I looked at this, and I'm looking at the use of, in my opinion, this is, it's not disruptive. It does impact in a positive way. And the innovative is just a way to look at how it impacts. Okay. So here, I'm going to make this evaluation. I'm going to make a claim. I'm going to make an evaluative argument. Not just decide something, but actually make the argument for why um, it's important or why it's necessary. Okay. So. Here's my claim. Trigger warnings are necessary in the modern classroom. Why? Because the experiences students bring to, into the classroom are very diverse. Okay. And in the course of my pitch or of my speech or my essay, I, might, I would have to talk about why it's diverse now in the modern classroom and wasn't in the past. And that would be the difference between innovative and not innovative. Okay. The warrant. And I'll, I'll come back to this. But the evidence that I would use to prove this might be the diversity of the student body. Why? Because I have to prove that it is diverse and how that makes an impact. Okay. Uh, the number of students that have suffered trauma. Okay. Why is that important? Okay. The experiences students bring into the classroom are very diverse, and those diverse experiences impact learning. Okay. Um, these are quantitative. Evaluate, evaluative evidence, but I might also use qualitative, anecdotal experience, students I've had or other teachers' experiences, comparison of class with or without trigger warnings. What does it look like? Okay, and this might be a fictional way of me talking about a hypothetical classroom, but it allows me to make that argument. It's evidence because it's supporting my claim. Okay, now a warrant is, and this goes back to that idea of value based criteria, a warrant is an unstated assumption, okay, an implied assumption. So by that I mean this is something that I assume when I make my claim. It might not be something that I talk about at all, but in making that claim, this is something that I also think, okay. So for instance, the modern classroom must meet students where they are, okay, not make students meet me with the material, but I need to meet them where they are and what they're thinking. Okay, so that's a that's a warrant. And what that means is if this is true, then this is true as well. Okay, this is the assumption underneath my claim. All right. So if I'm looking about your if I'm thinking about your project or if you're thinking about your project, you might think about what is the central claim you're making about the debate. You can make it could be as simple as is it important or not? Okay. De debate A is an important debate worth getting involved in, okay? Because at the end of the semester, that's something that you'll have done or worth paying attention to, okay? 
you don't have to explicitly say this thesis statement, this claim in the pitch, but it's a, it's central to what you're trying to prove. Okay. And why, why is it important? Because it impacts B or impacts C or whatever. You determine this for your pitch, but you want to figure this out. Okay. So of the two topics that you suggested last week, which one do you find more important? And then you might turn that into a claim and a reason why that claim is true. Okay. Uh, what assumptions lie behind your claim or lie under your claim? So, for instance, you know, we talked about with trigger warning, oh, the modern classroom must meet students where they are. This is part of this claim. But if I go back to your job, your I'm sorry, your prompt, and look at Black Lives Matter, okay? If I say my claim, Black Lives Matter is an important issue worth paying attention to, because you know, uh, because race relations have been so important to the history of the United States. Okay, then the under underlying assumption, or the assumption that lies under behind my claim, is that um, diversity is important. Okay, or that um, America as a melting pot is an ideal. Okay, that's an assumption. Why? Because if I want everybody to be involved, if I think that Black Lives Matter as much as everybody else, then that's something that's an assumption. Okay, or I might uh, one assumption underneath my claim might be that Black Lives Matter more. Okay, why? Because they are um, minorities, and that's important to a democratic society or something, something along those lines. All right. And then what evidence might you use to prove this claim? And that's where a lot of your pitch will come in, is talking about why it's important. Okay, Your pitch is basically making this argument. Why is it important? Why is this an important debate? You're making an evaluation on the importance of the debate to the class. Okay, So to the audience. All right? um, so that's where that comes in. All right. So <laughs> why do you need a claim? Because this is a rhetorical situation, because I'm asking you to persuade your classmates. This is not about just stating your opinion. This is about proving something to your audience. Okay, So that's where rhetoric comes in. Well, in order to actually have that rhetorical situation, you need, the, you need something, the third part of that triangle. You need the audience, you need the rhetor, and you need the subject. Okay, and that's what the claim is. Your claim is the subject. Okay, well, so it might seem unnecessary to have a central claim and an evaluative argument if you're just ranking it with friends or whatever. Um, but the criteria form a central focus. Okay, or as a criteria form a central focus, but this is far from the case. What you need is you need to take a stance or make a claim in order for the discussion of evaluative criteria to have any impact. Otherwise, it's just you spouting off. Okay. Um, so, for instance, I might say that, picking something stupid, um, that Starbucks coffee is overpriced because it tastes bad. Now, that doesn't make any sense, right? That it, it, Well, it does make sense. If it tastes bad, then you shouldn't pay as much. But um, it doesn't have any impact if I'm not making that stance that Starbucks coffee tastes bad. Now, if I say, I think that's, it's my opinion that I think that Starbucks tastes bad, that is taking out the claim and it's just saying it's your opinion. Well, then there's no point talking about it because then the next person can just say, well, I think that it tastes good or whatever. Okay, So that's what you're trying to do is to make this claim and make it persuasive for your audience, for your classmates. Okay. Uh, the burden of proof ca calls on the rhetor that proposed it to defend his claim. So if you make a claim, you need to prove that it's true. All right, and that's what the goal of the pitch will be. All right. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to skip over this because I'm, go I'm going long. Um, one thing that you may want to pay attention to, I didn't have you read it, but um, your book, or the not your book, the reading I scanned provides a way to build a proposal or build an evaluative argument with a proposal involved. That's basically what you're doing. And you might want to look at that as a way to help you along if you're struggling. Or, and again, feel free to email me. Okay. Um, so 
here we look at this. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you have your audience as your classmates. You are the rhetor. The subject is the importance of this um, debate or controversy. Okay. The exigence is the debate or controversy. All right. But the subject now, what I want you to think about is not just the the con or your opinion of the controversy, but your evaluation of the controversy. All right. So you don't need to weigh in yet on what whether or not you agree with Black Lives Matter or whether or not um, you think that. I'm sorry, I had to step away for a second. Um, the goal of this is not to sh to talk about whether or not you what your opinion is on the debate yet. Okay, so don't worry about that if you if you want to avoid it because you don't know as much as you will in a couple months. What you want to do is talk about whether or not this is important. Okay, so if you're talking about uh, uh, the heroin addiction in and the rise of heroin addiction and the treatment of it, all right, that's a debate. That's a controversy going on. How do we treat heroin addiction? Well, you might have an opinion on the best way to treat them, but what's best for now and part of the pitch is to talk about why that is an important debate to begin with. So the importance is the, the issue, the significance of the controversy, not necessarily what you would do about it or uh, your own personal opinions on it. So your goal is evaluation. Why uh, is this important? Why is it important? Is it trivial? If it's trivial, then you should ch choose a different topic. Is it, is it significant? Is it important? Then yes, talk about it. Okay. Um, the constraints, we'll talk a bit more when we talk about the audience in the next lecture. But uh, if you have any questions about this, please let me know. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about this project pitch, your goal is to present your material much, much like I'm presenting this to you and make a case for why your debate is important and needs to be paid attention to. From that pitch, once you make that case, we will make, we will, I will send out a survey and you will determine your top three choices. So which of the videos that you have watched because you will watch your classmates videos and out of those three, you'll choose the three top choices. And from that, I will determine your groups. Okay, so which debates did you find to be important because the pitch was persuasive? All right, and then you will rank them and I will form groups from that. Okay, your goal as the rhetor here is to convince your classmates, your audience, that this is an important controversy or this is an important debate that needs to be paid attention to or needs to be that you want to get involved in or that your the audience wants to get involved in all right your goal as the audience is to listen to their their speech their video presentation and make a determination on whether or not you agree and if you agree and you think it is important then you will rank it in the one two or three okay if you have any questions about this, please let me know. Um, if you have any questions about the uh, software, uh, the online applications, Presentation Tube or um, Zentation or Novio, please let me know. Um, otherwise, have a good weekend and take care.